I didn't understand the value of why I needed to be in this room until I was here. And, and it, it is kind of one of those things that it's, there's an overwhelming element to it, but when you immerse yourself in a room full of, you know, 75,000 filmmakers from around the globe and you get to network and you get to learn and you get hands-on experience with equipment in like no doubt in my mind, it helps level you up as a filmmaker in almost every area from like the business side to the tech side to, you know, just like the mindset that you approach filmmaking with. Welcome back to another episode of the Rough Cut Club. I am your host, Joey Nakotra, here in the studio today with my co-host, Mr. Shane Wright-Zammer, where we talk all things art and business for freelance filmmaking. And uh, man, we are back from Vegas today, man. Shane, did everything that happened in Vegas stay in Vegas, my friend? Everything, except <laughs> all my sleep, too. Yes, all the sleep is still there. I feel like I need 10 more hours, Dude, but we're here, man. We made yeah, it. Yeah, literally just got back yesterday, and I don't know about you, but I slept so hard last night. I think I got 10 hours of sleep, which never happens, and I went to bed at like 10 and woke up at, I think, 8, and I was like, I felt so recharged. It was phenomenal. See, I'm almost 40, and I had to do two days of that, so the last day in Vegas, <laughs> I just true. went to bed at 9 and woke up at like 6. That's I'm true. Old. And then yesterday, got a lot of good sleep too, man. And I'm still tired. But dude, yeah. one of the things about NAB is, I mean, you walk so much. My oh body my was gosh. just physically busted. Yeah. And I've worked long set days, dude. I've done 17-hour day on set. Yep. And I, it felt like that. It felt like that because there was so much walking 100%. involved there's so much stimulation going on yeah there's, oh dude I, i'm excited to unpack it with you yeah i i think i checked my step count and i was like on average between 20 and twenty two thousand steps a day for almost four days how many miles is that you it, imagine it's uh so i looked up and did the math and it's just a little bit over 10 miles of walking a day which that's, is really wild that's crazy um so. I don't think I got about 10 miles in it because yeah. I quit a little <laughs> earlier than you on all the days, yeah. but uh, you know, I'm old, so yeah. we'll, we'll call it five. Well, for those of you guys who are catching in on what we're talking about, we just got back from NAB 2024, and if you're not familiar with NAB, uh, it is the most overwhelming uh, filmmaking experience you could possibly imagine where over 75,000 filmmakers from across the world globally come in with thousands of uh, filmmaking broadcast vendors uh, to discuss the newest, latest, and greatest tech uh, and give you hands-on experience with some of the products and some of the new drops that are coming out either that day or in the coming year. Uh, and so it's really the pinnacle. It, someone, someone worded it as the Super Bowl for filmmakers and uh it, it definitely is a hundred percent dude they have they have full volume walls set up yeah. they have techno cranes they have drones flying over like there's just it's everything wild. and there's just rows and rows of booths and it's at the las vegas convention center which is yeah. huge again oh i mean miles and miles of booths yeah there's classes that go on some are free some you have to register for uh, there's the main stage that they have some big names on uh, dropping uh, their ideas about filmmaking and the business. Um, but beyond film and video, there's software for yeah. production companies to even manage their production company or assets. There's cloud storage. There's, you know, all types of things. Audio. Uh, there was a soundproof room you could go in just to yeah. see like the construction of what this company can offer for your studio. And so it just blew my mind. I did not understand the depth of uh, or the broadness of all the different things that yeah. I would see at NAB. Yeah, the scale of this place is like however big you think it is, like multiply times 10. Like it is truly like overwhelming. You feel like a ki if you love cameras, you're a kid in a candy shop that's like uh, literally miles and miles wide. It's insane. You know what's funny? I just signed up for the Texas Production Expo. Yeah. Uh, and I think this time's at Grapevine. Um, cool. Which is cool. But if anybody has gone to the Texas Expo, which is in Dallas, uh, 
Take that, multiply it by 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. 10, I'm not joking. And that's, it, it's insane. So when I was going, this was my first time to nap. Yeah. And I know we sent you last year, you had a blast yeah. and you came back, you told me all about it. And I was like, this sounds awesome. I definitely should go. I, you know, I don't, I don't shoot anymore. I don't even understand everything on the cameras, but it's good to be up to date with the technology. Yeah. And I got, there's the networking aspect. There's, there's so many value adds, which I'm sure we're totally. going to get into. But uh, going um, was just mind blowing because I was like, oh, whoa, like this is this is a multi day conference like you can't you can't see it all in one day. I mean, maybe no. you can if you ran uh, the 10 miles instead of walk. It, it, you literally can't. I mean, just in all the different rooms that they have, like they have four different halls and each hall is literally, I mean, multiple football fields, like probably like four four football fields in you know, size. It's, it's, it's overwhelming for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so I gotta, I gotta jump right in for, for maybe people that haven't gone or maybe people that have gone, what is the value for freelance filmmakers Mm -hmm. or filmmakers in general to go to NAB? Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about this and actually it was really enlightening to me. My very first year I went, which was last year, their hundredth year, uh, which is insane that they've been around for over a hundred years. But I mean, even if you're not a gearhead, you know what I mean? Like you're still super immersed in the film world and directing and producing and and stuff. And just seeing the vastness of all of the new tech that is out there, uh, it brings about new ideas for ways that you can tell stories in a new light. Mm. And so, especially like me as a DP, like it's all it's doing is feeding, you know, tools to my tool belt uh, even just mentally of knowing like what's out there to be able to do certain, uh, you know, effects, provide certain looks to a project. You know, it's just arming my mental tool belt when I go and and, and just really get to see, get hands on training and experience with some of these tools and wrap my mind around what the newest tech is out there for how films are being made today. Man, I, I got to jump in, too, because I think you said something really interesting that I didn't fully comprehend until I went this year. But when he said hands-on experience, it's literally almost every booth is an experiential booth. 100%. So like Sony, Blackmagic, um, you know, uh, Steadicam, Ari, all of these booths have cameras there that you can literally point and shoot at models that are (sighs) are actors that are walking on different stages. And they're full-blown like stages within these booths. So they might have like a cafe set up. So you can see how skin tones are reading on camera you can you know test out all the functions they've got their reps there yeah and so i remember joey had told me last year i think you had maybe strapped in on a steady cam and i know this yeah. year you did for sure oh, yeah and so think about it like you may not have the opportunity to go to a rental house and you know a lot of rental houses will let you come in and test out gear yeah. you know with the, the thought that you're going to rent it um but there's some you know opportunities there but otherwise, it's like, how do you get the reps on these things? And, yeah. and we're not talking like you're going to be an expert once you're done, but you are talking to the expert that's helping you strap in there. That, so if you can pay attention and really go through, you know, the steps with them. I mean, I mean, you tell me because I didn't 100%. strap in, but you, you probably feel a lot more confident now. hundred percent. When you're ready for your, your steady cam shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Steady cam is one of the things that I've been wanting to get into this year. Um, you know, if you, if you really know me, you know, that for like the first probably six years of me being a filmmaker, I was like deep in the glide cam world, uh, coming up on analog. And we did an episode very, very back at the beginning of this talking about glide cams versus gimbals. And I'm very pro, uh, you know, steady cam operation. Uh, but I haven't gotten into the steady cam space for, for cinema cameras. And what I got to do is, you know, it's one thing to shop around and look at, you know, how all they, how all of them feel, but I got to get hands-on experience getting strapped up in multiple different brands and learning about all the, you know, quirks of each individual model, the payload capacities, how the, how they feel, how you tweak them. Um, and it was just a really great way for me to learn about something that I'm still trying to get into more. Uh, as someone who's interested in that space. And so definitely really enjoyed, uh, you know, the hands-on experience. And even with lenses, you get to look through the different lenses and see how they're 
coded and how they, how the bokeh looks and, you know, what the breathing is like. And so if you're interested in even renting some of this equipment for future projects, uh, it's a really great way to have a, a grasp on what they all do. Uh, one of the other crazy things is there are certain tools out there that you don't even know are tools that you can use. Uh, for instance, I have a project that I'm doing uh, later this year. It's a feature that I'm in prep for that we're looking to do extreme high speed, uh, slow motion shots mm. for a project that we're doing. And, you know, in the world of like frame rates over a thousand frames per second, I still hadn't, you know, like I, I know of some of the cameras that are out there, but actually getting hands-on experience with mm. them to see, you know, how they work and, and, and all of the things that I need to be prepared for when I use that tool in a future project, I got to go find multiple different versions of tools that I didn't know existed that will help solve my problem that is coming up later this year specifically. Mm, and yeah. so it's just, it's a really great way to be, um, you know, feel equipped for future problems that you don't even know you're going to face. Mm. So good, man. And I think uh, I just got to throw out this other value add. If you're lucky, like our boy Joey over here or uh, Robbie and Solomon are two uh, filmmakers that we we do projects with. They win as well. We met some other guys out there. These guys, they go around and I didn't know this existed. So again, I was the first timer, but they went around to all the booths and a lot of these booths have raffles that you can enter, Yeah, uh, which is brilliant. You're right. They're collecting info I, I, from a business perspective. I'm like, oh, that's it's genius. And so they collect the info, they do a raffle. Well, Joey ends up walking out with a ton of swag, ton of products. Um, and then same thing for Robbie and Solomon. I mean, between y'all, I'm guessing like over like three or four thousand dollars oh, worth of gear. It, it was honestly probably closer to seven or eight. It was God, like and free merch. Yeah. So we won two V mount batteries with a dual charger. We won like a uh, probably almost three thousand dollar tripod. Uh, Robbie and Solomon won the iPhone 15 Pro. Let's go. Uh, and then like a ton of other like miscellaneous merch. And it was like they, you know, between all three of us, but especially them, there was definitely a major gear come up happening at NAB. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, speaking of value add, still, yeah. uh, networking I feel like is cannot be ignored oh, yeah. at this event. So, can you tell me about uh, who did you get to meet at this? Uh, Dude, NAB? you know what's crazy, man? Like when you go to this place, um, aside from like who who all I met. There's so many filmmakers that I talk with online through Instagram or, you know, social media that they've either reached out to me to connect with me or vice versa, or we've stayed in touch over the years, but we've never actually met in person. And like all of them come together in this room and you meet like at least five or six people or more that you're like, oh, bro, like I just saw you, but like we've been talking for like two or three years, mm. like so good to link up, like you know, what's, what's been your favorite thing that you've experienced here? And then like, oh, well, let's go check out this booth together. Or like, let's go grab a drink after the event's over and like, let's kick it. And uh, it's just like a super dope way to connect with people that like you've been in touch with, uh, but haven't been able to be in the same room with. And, and not only that, but like I've linked up with multiple filmmakers that I've looked up to and respected um, and gotten to just have like a 20 minute conversation with them or, or more like last year, uh, I, I randomly walked into Rory Kramer, who was a massive inspiration to me when, uh, especially when I was getting my start in filmmaking and I listened to like an hour long presentation with him. And then afterwards he was like, yo dude, are you hungry? Like, let's go grab a slice. And it was like dope. Like I just got to go like have a meal with like a filmmaker who I really looked up to and who's inspired me on my journey. And it was like, that was like a super cool moment for me. But like, and, and, and you know, we just had Tom Totter on the, the episode, but he started Prism Lens Effects and him and I connected at NAB uh, last year and have just stayed in touch, uh, you know, in previous years. And he had me on his podcast, uh, talking about my worst day ever, mm -hmm. uh, on, on a film set. So if you haven't heard that episode, definitely check that out. Um, but man, it's just, you know, got to link up with the prison lens effects dudes, got to, got to meet Shane Hurlbut, which is like, uh, one of 
the leader industry leaders in filmmaking education. If you haven't checked out the Filmmakers Academy, it's definitely been one of the biggest resources that has helped me level up as a DP. Got to sit under his classes and then just talk with him. Like, bro, I could go on and on. Okay, man. okay, I gotta jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us the funny story that happened when you were meeting Shane. Oh Robbie my and- god, bro! <laughs> oh you gotta share gosh. this story, bro. Oh my gosh! So there- I wish I was there for this. Yeah, I had gone uh, back to the hotel oh early, gosh. but yeah, tell us. So tell us while there are amazing things that happen at NAB, uh, some people get a little bit carried away with their vlogging, and uh, <laughs> this one dude walks up and he's like rolling solo vlogging, and he goes to have a conversation with Shane, like right in front of me, uh, Shane Hurlbut, I should specify, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, he like asks this girl who's like right next to him. He's like, Hey, can you, uh, hold this camera and film me talking? And she's like, sure. And you know, most of the time you think people are going to go and spend like 30 seconds to a minute or whatever. And, and it's like three minutes later and she's like, dude, I gotta go. Like I have an appointment. I literally have to get to right now. And he goes and was like, Oh, okay. Well, uh, can, can you film? And literally like doesn't read the room that, that it's time to wrap up his, his dialogue. He's going full blown interview, baby. full blown. So I'm like, I'll take the camera and I film like, you know, it just, I was right there. And, uh, literally four minutes later, I'm still filming this guy, like doing an episode, like a random, you know, episode. And I'm, I'm like, Oh dear God. Like, what did I sign up for? <laughs> like, why, why am I? And I'm like, Ugh. I have a bag literally in my hand. That's like full of stuff and a camera in my hand. And it's just like the weight distribution is horrible. And, uh, I look Uh, at his settings and I'm like, why are we shooting at these settings? Like everyone else is walking around. I'm like, I promise I didn't set these camera settings. Right. They're like, oh, don't judge me. Are you this guy's uh, (laughs) personal uh, content creator? You're like, no, I'm a a DP. You should have just flipped the camera around, bro, the whole time and like filmed your your face. Oh my gosh. And handed it back to him. Like, I hope you like the episode. Yeah, it was was really wild. Oh man, you told me that later that day. (laughs) I just, I couldn't stop laughing. Just like, you know, you're trying to be nice and you just end up in an awkward situation. Oh my gosh. And, and like, then you were you were waiting to talk to Shane yeah, as well. and I was waiting. You should have whipped out your iPhone and been like, 100%. "Hey, bro, your turn. Hold the 100%. iPhone. You're filming all this." Yeah. It was, <laughs> anyway, so funny funny moments happen, but man, I got to uh, I got to listen in on. I went to I think you know aside from Shane Hurlbut's like you know full lighting breakdown, which you know he's a genius, uh, which was which was amazing. I got to listen to two other really awesome main stage speakers. Um, Sean Evans, who's the host of the hot ones, um, which is, you know, a a YouTube interview show where, and, and, and podcast where, um, if you haven't seen it, you definitely should. Where basically they're eating hot wings. That say, get, you're making me want a wing right now. Right, in- incrementally hotter and hotter to the point where you know his questions begin heating up as the wings begin to heat up and the guests get more and more uncomfortable. It's a brilliant, brilliant concept. Uh, but I got to listen to him, which as a podcaster myself was totally invaluable to hear like some of the stories and how he came up and and how he learned and. Uh, you know, when he feel like he caught his stride doing, you know, his craft and how he still doesn't feel like he's hit his stride yet as one of the most like successful, like interview hosts uh, in the game. He's, you know, getting to listen to him on, on how he, um, you know, just built the, built the brand and the ideas and how it came about was invaluable to draw inspiration from, you know, even just for our own, stuff i feel like so many people have this imposter syndrome like the i still haven't made it type right. thing and and right. so that's great to hear because you go you know you're always looking at where you're going to be the next month the next year you know the next five years yeah. and so that's a good you know it's humility which is great but also always goal sets that you can do bigger yeah. and better the next time around right whether it's a film set podcast season podcast episode so I'm excited for you to unpack some of that, bro. Well, in the Rough Cut Club. So um, let's, uh, let's dude, definitely. Dude, yeah. So like on top of on top of that, like mm. on top of Sean Evans saying it, I took a class from Valentina V last mm. year, um, who she you know does a lot of videos for Aperture and has been uh, like a brand ambassador for them. And one of the classes was I, I forget the the exact title of it, but it was basically just like problems that she's had on set over the years Mm. and and just listening to somebody who you respect talk about the problems that they've had or like 
the the imposter syndrome that they had like i told her i was like man this is one of my favorite like classes that i got to sit in on just because it made me realize like people that are doing it at a higher level than i'm doing are going through all the exact same thoughts that i experience as an artist mm. and just being in a room where you're like dang even this person who i really respect like sean evans did all of the exact same steps that i'm doing um or had all of the same thoughts and doubts and you know hiccups along the road uh just knowing that you're on the right track because you're experiencing the problems that you're having and the doubts that you're having w gives you a level of peace that you can only experience by sitting around other people who are that you respect who have had the same problem it's great so. man that's that is encouraging yeah what's uh what's uh yeah I, I think you mentioned a couple of people that you sat in on but what's one of the biggest uh or what are some of the big takeaways that mm -hmm. you gained from some of these uh classes yeah. or sessions or even yeah. nab in general like what's some of the big takeaways you got for us man so the other the other <laughs> big class that i got to to sit in on was uh casey neistat and oh, so yeah. casey neistat he's he's definitely on the rough cut clubs wall of uh people goals to get uh on the show yeah but uh man I, when i was at unt this is back in 2017 i think like right before we met um, he actually came to our university and did like, you know, a, a talk and a presentation. And this is back when he was still doing his daily vlog. Um, but Casey was somebody who, you know, as a filmmaker coming up in that era, I was obviously a huge fan of, and I think his impact on filmmaking will forever be solidified as one of like the more brilliant YouTubers who have ever made videos on the platform. Um, but listening to him <clears throat> talk about how he approaches his videos um it it just makes you stop and reflect on like why you make videos and and you know how as an artist the mindset that you have when you approach your videos just matters hugely um, and sometimes we can be so fast to, oh, we got to do this client project. We got to, we got to keep going in. And like, as somebody who has had, uh, the pressure of a daily story to tell, like find 10 minutes of every day to tell an interesting story mm. and listening to, um, how that created pressure for him to, to where he actually stopped making his daily show because he felt like he, he, the things that he was criticizing about himself were what the YouTube comments were starting to criticize him for. Mm. And that was like a really tough thing for him to swallow because he was like, man, I realized like I have put so much pressure on myself to tell, tell a daily story that I feel like I've run out of interesting things to say. Mm. And my, listeners are also reciprocating that. Hmm. And so listening to how that influenced his approach to storytelling, um, you know, this was one of the cool things. If you, if you got to watch the solar eclipse, uh, recently he was like, everyone who was filming the solar eclipse was taking their phone out and they were pointing it at the sun. And he was like, that's not the story that's being told here at all. The story that's being told here is me pointing the camera at my friends and seeing the human experience mm. of what will only happen once in a lifetime and the laughs and the awe of the people sitting around us. And it's like the people that are pointing their phone at the sun, they're missing the story of what's happening because of that. Mm -hmm. And and just how his mind works and in, in looking at where is the story here? It's yeah. not the big interesting thing that's happening. It's the how that big interesting thing is affecting the people that are experiencing it. And I just loved like listening to how his mind searches for the important story in the room versus what the obvious story is to look at and shoot. Yeah. And it was just so influential to me to listen to someone who is a master at telling stories and then get to pull little bits and pieces of that and into my own tool belt. Man, that's so good. That's yeah, I love that approach. And it's really, I mean, it's it's also everybody's got that shot of yeah. the sun, right? Yeah. But not yeah. everybody can have a shot of you exactly. reacting to it. And that's why 
it's also from a marketing perspective or a storytelling pers- it's unique yeah right because people are unique where like the the sun yeah you right. might have a cool or different angle or you've got you know something in the shot that other people don't have but that's that's awesome man that's yeah. a great takeaway yeah and adding that to the the mental uh, storytelling tool belt yeah. for sure yeah you know he he talked about one other thing too he's like you know when people he he does a ton of like gear and gadget like reviews and stuff like that and but he's like you know when people ask me what camera i shoot with it's one of the most insulting questions i feel like somebody could ask mm. because at no point in time like if you watch one of the greats uh like he he referenced like schindler's list and he's like if I got a chance to talk with the director from Schindler's list, do you think I'm going to ask him what camera he shot with? No, I'm going to, I'm going to ask him like what was in his mind when he was telling the story that he wanted to convey to the audience and what was his, you know, like important questions rather than what camera and lens did you use to, you know, do this. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm never going to go. Like if I had a chance to meet Picasso, I'm never going to ask him about what paint he used to paint his pictures with Mm -hmm. what paintbrush he chose it's not about those tools it's about like tell me from your artistic you know perspective like what were you trying to communicate like how did this impact you and you know other deeper important questions about the story and not the technical you know nuance of the lens coating that's on the lens you know well and i think it goes it, i love that and i think it goes deeper too because it's all it is insulting because it's like well why do you want to know the camera and the lens because right. you're not gonna be able to copy what i just did totally right so you like i can tell you the camera and the lens and, and it is probably one of the most asked questions even in forums online and stuff and, and i get it like yeah. you're coming up you're like man what what are these people using but it's not about the tools right. it's about what you do with them and so like right doesn't matter if it's the iPhone or, you know, red, whatever it is, Ari, it's about how you use them and then why you're using them that way. Exactly. Right. The why. And so I think that's probably why it's so insulting because it's like, yeah, dude, you don't even care why I'm doing it. You just want to know what it is so that you can go buy that or try to shoot with that. So you can say that you're using the same thing that's on this show or you expect to get the same result because you've seen it in this, but you don't even understand the why. Right. Yep. You uh you don't ask uh you don't compliment a chef's oven when he makes a good meal. You compliment the chef and it's not about the tool that he used to get the job done. It's about, you know, the knowledge and experience he used to make the meal the way it came out. Depends how pretty the oven is. That's true. You know, I just got this convection (laughs) oven and I will say that the convection oven actually does cook better than the conventional. (laughs) I will say. So Uh, I'm backpedaling just a tiny bit, but at the end of the day, the gear doesn't matter. Oh my gosh. Um, Man, you got to cook me something, bro. Dude, I know it's almost lunchtime. Yeah, steak steak time. One of the, uh, one of the other takeaways too, that I thought was really fascinating. uh, I got to talk with Shane Hurlbut afterwards. Um, and he was, he was saying, you know, uh, the conversation of, you know, just advancing in, uh, the career to like the level of films that he's done. He, he made Terminator salvation amongst like 20 other massive films, act of valor, uh, some big films that are out there today. Uh, the longest game, the greatest game ever played Mm. some, you know, great, brilliant movies. Um, but he, was telling me, he was like, you know, I've been in this industry for 34 years. Of those 34 years, seven of those years, I've worked for free. Wow. And just let that sink in for a second. Like we were talking about like the value of free work Mm -hmm. um, and about doing things that you're not paid for. And he's like, seven years of my career went unpaid. And, And just like, you know, as somebody who's been in the industry, you know, and has risen to literally the highest degree that you can, um, you know, as a DP, uh, to listen to the value, you know, he was saying like, it's so important to not think about the money when you're doing these projects, um, and think about just doing what serves the project best. Mm. And if you continually do just whatever it takes to serve the project best and not make money the forefront motivator and you making art, uh, people will notice it and it will come back to you uh, in dividends when you literally just put whatever needs to be done for the project ahead of whatever profit you should deserve. And I was like, man, that's just so 
again, all these little things that are just like hearing it from somebody mm. in that position. Like we, we, we know these things, but hearing it in like a new light from somebody just reinforces the narrative of like why we do what we do and how we can do it better. Yeah. And I think that, <clears throat> you know, you just being in a room like NAB, you just get, you know, bro. Oh, yeah. That's so, that's why I always used to get so frustrated when I was talking to new DPs. Yeah. Uh, when they would, the first question was, well, what's the budget? And I know, and I know you do need to know that because of, you need to know what you're working with for, you know, lighting grip, you know, camera selection, all that stuff. But when it was the first thing, instead of almost to what Casey's saying and what Shane, it's like, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. What's the story that we're trying to convey? What's the end result we want to accomplish, right? Like serve the art first and then worry about the money later right instead of the first question being well what's yeah. the budget because i need to figure out how much i can make on this and right. how much i have to play with so now let's hear what you want to do yeah. right so like starting with the why and the and the what yeah you know is so much better than the how right the how 100%. comes after 100 percent, man so what's the uh what's one of the coolest things that you saw at the show man. what's some of your favorite things that you see that's coming out that you're excited about yeah man so I would say that the black magic camera was like the hottest item. I feel like buzzing around, um, but they didn't have the 17 K there, did they, they? So, so, so they had a, they had a different camera drop. It's okay. called the pixies. Yeah. Um, which I think is like the thing that everyone was kind of buzzing about Okay, that I felt like shined the loudest at, at the was that the small one that's supposed to kind of look like Komodo? It's, it's, it's the square yeah, box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. the six K. You know, it's basically the six K, essentially repackaged in a different form factor that is more suitable for custom buildouts and with a full frame sensor. Nice. Um, and so, uh, what was interesting about it though is that myself included and other people are s like. Some people are really stoked about it. I was on the pessimistic side of things where I was kind of underwhelmed by it mm. um, just because they literally repackaged the 6K camera in a different form factor that it felt like, <laughs> yeah, you can custom build it out a little bit easier, but at the end of the day, I think most people just feel like they're shooting on a cinema camera when they have a form factor like that. Mm. And, and they you know left out a lot of big features that people were wanting, but after talking you know with more people in the room i do think that it was a move to um make people incentivized to buy their higher end cameras with all the features that uh, are on it yeah. and so they like kind of intentionally stunted yeah it's the, the apple move it's the 100 percent. it's the max 100 percent. and it's like they everyone wants built-in nds and yeah. like you know these different features that are like they have them, but you got to buy the, the bigger one to get them. You know, it'd be so interesting to know like production, like on the backside, oh, they're like, okay, gosh. so we only produced like, you know, 20,000 of these, but we, you know, we produce, yeah. we know that these are going to sell, but oh, these are helping us 100%, sell the, the more expensive ones. A hundred percent. And yeah. so it's like, a, you know, brilliant marketing masterminds are, are behind yeah. there. And I already had mm. like literally three people hit me up that said they're going to buy it. And so mm. like people are hyped about yeah, it. Selling. And, and, and don't get me wrong. Like, I think it's an amazing camera like it, the black magics are making some of the best bang for your buck on the market i was about to say it, affordable price right 100%. so you're getting the form factor 100%. it looks you know it's it's built out like komodo it to some extent and so 100 you know you're feeling like you're shooting with the cinema kit yeah and, and and to be fair you are like the black magics make like cinema grade quality you can match them up with an alexa all day long and nobody's gonna know the difference but um as somebody who's interested in the specs of a camera, like I will say the the ergonomics and form factor of the Blackmagic Pocket camera was was never its strong suit. Um, so th this is a good move. I will say I, while I was underwhelmed, I do think it's a good move, um, but that was probably like the hottest item that I felt like most people were like, hey, have you gone to check out this booth yet? Right, right. Um, but you know, I got, the, uh, I will say that in the Steadicam space, the 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 new Volt that Tiffin just announced, I was wildly impressed by, mm. wildly impressed with. Um, that was something that when I got to get hands on training with that Steadicam, that I was like, dude, you guys have created something here that is really a game changer. Um, you know, making sure your horizon line is level, uh, all the like custom ability of like the different the pan, the tilt, the roll. Like it was it was really cool to me. 
Um, Insta 360 blew me away actually. So the 360 camera that came out, they had a video where they, this guy filmed a butterfly. And if you know anything, if you've ever seen a butterfly fly, you know, it's flight path is like so unpredictable. And they just had the camera that they ballpark were tracking with it. And at the very beginning of the clip, you can do this from your phone. Now you just tap the butterfly and it will AI will auto track through and create like a shot um, that like intuitively locks on to um, whatever target you select. And like the workflows that they have for their 360 degree cameras now are amazing. Dude, I was amazing. I was, I saw that presentation done and they were talking yeah. about how, you know, they mentioned this and we ran into this too. Is like we had, we were shooting a little 360 here and there for stuff and we were, you know, putting it into some yeah. of our edits. And a lot of our editors, you know, that was a hurdle for them to get over. Like, how do I operate and edit with this type of file format? How do yeah. I really take advantage of everything that we have here? You know, big world, small world, all, all the things that you can yeah. do. And during the presentation, I don't I don't understand it all because I'm not the tech guy anymore. But basically, they had, they had brought that up. They're like, look, we know that editors like have struggled with this. So we have created a, a process now to make it super yeah. streamlined so that you can basically tell it what you want yeah. for that format. And so I'm excited about it because now it's we kind of slowed down on the 360 yeah. stuff, man. We did even, you know, we'll do it for BTS. We'll do it for, you know, some music videos, commercial product. And it's like, well. Now maybe we can bring it back in if the workflow is a little, oh, yeah. you know, faster and for approachable sure. for any editors, right? So like sometimes our behind the scenes editors, you know, um, you know, are, aren't as experienced as our you know sure. broadcast spots, right? Sure, they're working their way up, and so if it's accessible and they can now work with totally. that footage, then it's just giving us a new opportunity 100%. with our content. So yeah, I was I actually caught uh, that on yeah, yeah, day yeah. one that I was there, which was actually Monday. Um, and it was, it was, it was really cool to see. Dude, one of the things, I don't think you got a chance to see this, but, uh, innovative really impressed me too. So innovative mm -hmm. makes camera carts and yeah. they're like top of the line camera carts. Um, and they just came out with a brand new cart that has a built in motor to it. So with, I have seen that dude. And, and it's not, it's not cheap, but yeah. like when I was Saw using it, on IG. It, like literally you can, Cause, cause if you've ever pushed like a fully, you know, stacked camera cart and you've got a trek with it, like a long ways, like it can be exhausting. And this literally on the handle is like, got like a, a button that you press to go forwards or backwards. It's got a handbrake. It can lock on like a 45 degree, yeah. like hill, like no problem. And I was like, dude, you guys created a game changing camera cart with a motor on it. Like that is, that is pretty G. If you missed NAB... I would say get on Instagram. It's flooded right now oh, with all bro. the new tech, all the new product. Because there were there were so many of us there with you know yeah. popping out the phones, taking video of this and that, people demoing things. Yep. Like every you know um, uh, supplier, you know B and H, and all the way down to you know Aperture, whoever they have yeah. all of their new products shown on their IGs yeah. from NAB and it's super cool to watch like I've just been I've been spending way too much time on Instagram yeah. now just going through and I'm like oh yeah. dude I missed that or like oh yeah I saw that and now I'm actually seeing a demo of it yeah uh you know like the before and after shots like the behind the scenes right. and then what it's capturing so definitely a really really cool experience get on IG right dude, now for I don't sure. know when this episode's going to drop but it's still pretty fresh and so yeah. all the new tech is coming out and being shown so I know we have to wrap this soon, but why would you why would you encourage a freelance filmmaker to go to NAB? Man, I was talking with a buddy of mine, Robbie, uh, while I was there, like at the end of it, and uh, about this exact question and topic, and he was like, "Man, it was his first time going," and he was like, "I didn't understand the value." of why I needed to be in this room until I was here. And and it it is kind of one of those things that it's there's an overwhelming element to it. But when you immerse yourself in a room full of, you know, 75,000 filmmakers from around the globe and you get to network and you get to learn and you get hands-on experience with equipment in like no doubt in my mind, it helps level you up as a filmmaker uh in almost every area from like the business side to the tech side to you know just like the mindset that you approach filmmaking with 
um, the connections. Like I've I've gotten business referrals from from going to NAB. We've had multiple guests that I met at NAB, like on the podcast, that we're still in relationship with and will likely be lifelong friends and and continue to you know. Uh, stay connected through their filmmaking journey and mine. And now I have access to their, you know, contacts and I've bought gear from them that, you know what I mean? Like I've, uh, it, it's, it's helping build your network and your, you know, staying like keeping your shorts sharp uh, with the tech that's going on in the industry so that you can tell stories in a more efficient way. Yeah, so. man, you nailed it. I think that the networking aspect blew my mind. I think that yeah. was huge. And not only, <laughs> you know, is NAB going on, but then you have all of Vegas, right? So like, you know, there's after parties where they're just mixers and socials oh where, gosh. yeah, with <laughs> your badge, you get into this club or this area. And so then there's just all these filmmakers that you need to be, you know, uh, swapping phone numbers with, 100%. swapping stories with, finding out you know where they operate in, what they do, how y'all can collaborate together, and then like you know just to jump back on the gear side, like I think that hands-on experience, like actually getting to hold and operate different uh, pieces of equipment with the expert there, and they're totally. not they're not sales <laughs> reps, they're not like sitting there trying to like get you to purchase it. That's the cool thing too. They're literally just like. Hey, I want to I want to show you what it can do, and like they're yeah. asking you questions, like what do you do? What do you, how do you how would you utilize this? And so they're almost like receiving uh, market feedback yeah. live as well. And so you know I saw that happen a lot, like at the Adobe booth. You know that you see editors talking to the Adobe reps, like hey, this is kind of what we need to do, and I run yeah. this issue. <clears throat> so it's just such a great learning experience and network experience, and a lot of fun, man. We Dude, we so had a much blast. Fun. Uh, like I said, I still got to catch up on sleep, but here we are in the studio talking about NAB. And if you go to NAB next year, you could hit Joey and I up. I think I'm going to make the commitment now. I think this should be a yearly thing for our Cinema Story 100%. team. Joey, you and I got to make another trip back out there. Ain't got to tell me twice, brother. We got more gear to demo, more people, uh, more hands to shake. I almost said more people to shake. <laughs> yeah. That's later at the uh, club. Right, 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 man. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it was a good time, man. If you guys have not gone to NAB, highly recommend it in 2025. Know that you will see Joey and Shane there. Got to come check it out, man. Uh, anything else you want to say on that before we wrap it out, bro? Man. No. <laughs> <laughs> Covered it all, guys. Thank y'all for joining us on this episode of the Rough Cut Club, and we will see you next time, next week, signing out.